I want to thank Chief Judge Morris for presenting the award. And you could probably tell, listening to her speak, that she was not born in Brooklyn. <laughs> she is actually from a little town called Chillicothe, not in Ohio, but in Texas. And they, I'm sure that notwithstanding the fact that she's the chief judge of the Southern District of New York Bankruptcy Court, she was really invited so that I would be able to hear at least one person tonight speak without an accent. <laughs> I, uh, I want to thank my longtime friend Bill Brandt for in calling me about this event. I thank Amy Kyle and the board of directors of Tenant's Wish, and especially I want to thank Andy Brosman and his kids for honoring Tina's wish. And I thank all of you for supporting this endeavor. I think it's quite impressive that in just a few years, this has become the third largest private funding source dedicated to early detection research for ovarian cancer. It's a testimony to all the members of your family, and I thank you. I'd like to talk a little about why the mission of Tina's Wish is so important and why the way the mission is being pursued, in my opinion, is even more important. Cancer of one form or another is a terrible scourge that touches virtually every family. Not just, as we sometimes think, in developed societies, but the world over. After the Rwandan genocide and after I left office, I was asked to join with our, our Health Access Initiative and Dr. Paul Farmer and Partners in Health and rebuilding the healthcare network of Rwanda because the only hospital left standing after the genocide was in the capital city of Kigali. And there are eight districts. So we went about trying to f finish what we were asked to do. And the last hospital we built was near the Ugandan border in a beautiful place called Butaro. It is now the only cancer center in Central Africa. And we decided we had to do it because we learned the cancer rates were the, more or less the same for Africans across the board as they were for other people. And we thought about AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and waterborne diseases, but not about that. The great uh, race car driver, Jeff Gordon, gave us a million and a half dollars to build that cancer center. And it, like every other children's hospital in the world, is interconnected now with St. Jude's so that everything is open source, all the discoveries are shared, and the latest treatments are available. I think the most important thing you have done, even more than raise the remarkable amount of money you have, is to organize this cooperative network of Dana Farber, Johns Hopkins, Memorial Sloan Kettering, the University of Pennsylvania, Ovarian Cancer Research Center, and the Yale Cancer Center to work together to establish a tissue bank of ovarian tumor samples, to learn together more about the disease, the genomic variances, its progression, and the responses to various therapies. You are doing something no researcher could do alone, and you are multiplying the impact of the money given to this endeavor many fold over what it would be if all you did was write a check to a single place. And I think it's really important that all of you understand this. Look, this is the only gynecological cancer for which there is no known early detection. If you catch it early, it's already got a 91% cure rate. 60% of the people are found so late, the cure rate dropped to 27%. Obviously, if you don't do anything but figure out how to catch it early, you will raise the survival rate to 90% around the world once you get the treatment out there and the 
detection devices out there around the world. That's why when we started on AIDS over a decade ago, one of the things that we realized that no, it was that no matter how low we drove the price of medicine, it wouldn't do any good unless we had a delivery system that included massive testing and then continued monitoring to see whether the initial medication was working. But you have another opportunity by supporting Tina's Wish because of this consortium and because of the changing way cancer in general is being treated thanks to the evolution of the human genome studies, both the sequencing, which was completed in my last year as president. I spent $3 billion of your money on that. <laughs> and, uh, and it's the best money I ever spent. You should be happy. <laughs> Four or five years ago, we already had documented $180 billion of economic activity that had grown out of it in the health space, and now it's fast approaching a trillion. And what once cost $3 billion has dropped to $5,000, and as the judge said, I believe it soon will be around $1,000, and once it gets that low, it's just a question of how many people you can get to take the test before we drive it down to 100 bucks and it becomes a routine part of medical care. Now, the reason that's important is that the most forward-looking cancer treatments now are relying on the individual characteristics of the tumors in question, not where they happen to be located in the body. And some breathtaking, dramatic examples of progress are in evidence. I have a friend who started doing this a few years ago, and he was brought a woman who thankfully had sequenced her genome, who was told she had just a few weeks to live with uh, advanced stage pancreatic cancer. And because he had the genome sequencing and could then do the requisite diagnostic testing with a program that worked in less than a minute, Three years later, she's still alive and has good quality of life. So I'm telling you this because all this is out there. You figure out a way to detect this, then you'll immediately take the cure rate to 91 percent for everybody that can access care. Then there'll be a whole bunch of gifted people who figure out how to get the detection system out to everybody else, not just here but around the world. But once you do that, then you will be able to maximize the impact of these dramatic scientific advances. And you may actually do something that would truly honor Tina's wish, make it so 100% of the people recover and live normal lives. At I was telling the folks backstage, and I was down at St. Jude not very long ago, about a year ago, I guess. They asked me to come back because they had been among the strongest supporters of the Human Genome Project and trying to talk that money out of the Congress. And so they said to me, your $3 billion test now costs 5000 bucks," And they took me to see a little boy who had a form of brain cancer, and it was rare, and I apologize for not remembering it at the time. But he said, the cancer this young man has, when he showed up here, has a, had already an FDA-approved, accepted treatment. And it's 100% effective for 80% of the kids. The problem is, it seems to kill the other 20% quicker. So he said, because we get so many of these kids, one of our innovative doctors started playing around and just trying to guess, and he gave one of the kids that wasn't getting better a half dose. And that child got better, just like the other 80 percent. 
So then he thought, well, maybe we've been giving everybody too much. So he gave one of the kids that was getting well a half dose, and he started getting sicker. Thanks to the genome, they identified both what they had in common that caused the cancer and what was different that called for different kinds of treatment. So now, instead of playing basically this kind of testing game, they just do a genomic test on every child that shows up. They know whether they need the full dose or the half dose, and they went from an 80 percent cure rate, 20 percent fatality rate, to 100 percent cure rate. These things are going to happen in ways that take your breath away. It is crazy that we cannot detect this condition early. And therefore, if you're just thinking about something that an average citizen can do that could really make a difference in our global fight against cancer that comes into the homes of virtually every one of us, there's probably nothing that is more likely to give you a quick, rewarding, human, meaningful rate of return than coming up with enough money to figure out how the heck to solve this problem. I mean, you've got to understand, everything else is going on around it that will explode the impact that this would have had if, for example, you figured out early detection 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, or 20 years ago. On the other hand, every single person with a family member with ovarian cancer from now on is going to be tearing their hair out because they know good and well they'd be right at 100 percent cure potential if we had early detection. So you're in the space of something important. The only other thing I want to say is that I want to reemphasize whether you can give this endeavor $100 or $100,000 or whatever, the fact that this network is doing this work together will drastically amplify your contribution. If there is one solid rule that obtains all around the world, it is that creative networks of cooperation are the best way to solve problems faster, quicker, and cheaper, and better. The, you just see it everywhere. The, the cities in America that came back quickest and were better off than they were before the financial crash were the ones where you had government, the private sector, the non-governmental sector all working together saying, what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? How are we going to get out of this? What are we going to do? Most people think of Orlando as Disney World. At least most parents, and I hope one grandparent or two I can think of <laughs> gets to experience that again. But most people don't know it is the home to 100 computer simulation companies. 100. Why? Because to make Disney World interesting, you need good computer simulation. And there's a universal entertainment park there. They need it, too. So global entertainment part, uh, <coughs> arts move their video game division there, too. You ever been addicted to a video game? You know you've got to have good simulation. So NAFTA started spending, NASA started spending, and the Defense Department started spending combined $5 billion a year in research on computer simulation. Why? Because it's a lot cheaper to teach somebody to drive a tank, fly an airplane, or take a spaceship up and get it back on a simulator than the real deal, and safer. And because it can be repeated, better prep. So they got 100 computer simulation companies. And they have a big university. And the university gives the professors a year and a half off if they come up with a commercially viable application. So now the University of Central Florida is the third largest undergraduate school in America after Michigan and Ohio State. And it's, most people don't know that. But the point is, they did it because they built a thick network of cooperation by people who knew what the heck they were doing and had clear objectives. 
San Diego has become one of the centers of human genome research because Craig Fenner, Venner, who led the private sector effort to sequence the human genome, put his foundation there. And you've got to have a lot of computing power to fool with genome research because since all our bodies have 3.6 billion of them, none of us have ever seen one. Now there are 700 computer companies in San Diego. So it is much more defined by its genomic present and potential than by the fact that for a long, long time it has been, a sec in a essence, the naval capital of the United States. That's what you can do with this. And you'll save more lives doing this than just about anything else you can do. It, you will be shocked when they finally figure out how to do early detection, how relatively inexpensive it will be quickly. The most important question facing the world today in a thousand different areas is how. How do you turn your good intentions and your deepest dreams into real changes that help other people's lives? It's funny, you know, we started this political season again, and I was thinking, all the, I liked politics a lot when I was in it, but I, we spent <laughs> almost all the, almost all the, all the questions debated were, what are you going to do, and how much money are you going to spend on it? Even for a lot of the people here, what are our research priorities, and how much are we going to get? But if you're in the arena, you have to answer a third question, which I believe will become increasingly important in the 21st century world, which is whatever it is you're going to do and however much money you have or don't, how, <coughs> how do you propose to do it? It is indisputable from mountains of evidence that networks of creative cooperators answer the how question better and quicker than any other decision-making device. There's enough social science research to fill this room demonstrating that if instantaneously, and it's a hazardous endeavor in this room, we could pick the person here with the highest IQ and take that person to a suite and meet his or her every need for 48 hours. And the rest of us, Porsche love, were forced to stay here. And they brought us coffee and donuts every now and then. And over the course of this two-day period, we were fed 20 questions. And the genius was fed 20 questions. Over two decades and 20 questions, we would give better answers than the genius. There is a huge amount of evidence to support this. So this is a problem that needs to be solved. When you solve it, it won't be very expensive to spread it like wildfire. And they have chosen the right way to solve the problem. And in the life I live now and in, in our foundation and health care and trying to help small farmers in Africa and trying to help poor village women in the Andes Mountains earn the first income they've ever learned by, earned by creating a whole new supply and distribution chain or helping poor fishermen in Cartagena, Colombia finally earned a decent price by giving them a cell phone so they know what the fish are supposed to sell for, and then setting up a cooperative processing operation that once the cash of the investors is recovered with no profit, they're just going to give to the, to the fishing cooperative. These kinds of things all require groups of people to work together to meet common goals. But just think how you will feel if thanks to your contributions, we solve the detection riddle. And think how you'll feel if we don't. When you read in the paper, as you will in the next five years, I promise you, it's cancer after cancer after cancer after cancer. We're at a 90% cure right now. We're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing the other thing. We're, we're moving toward being able to deal with this. And I haven't even talked about the impact nanotechnology, I believe, is going to have on this because you're going to be able to do diagnostic screening at low cost, if necessary, three or four times a year if you have, like, the BRAC1 or BRAC2 variation and you're a young woman with those genes, so your chances of getting breast cancer go up. 
And all these doctors within a decade, and certainly within a few years more than that, since they already know that we all have malignant cells running around in our bodies all the time, and most of them are just disposed of in the ordinary course of our bodies functioning, they're going to actually be debating, thanks to nanotechnology, whether it is too early to zap this or that little collection of malignant cells. I mean, this thing is running like a freight train. And ovarian cancer and all the huge number of people that die from it are being held, it's being held back only because of the absence of early detection. That's what you're contributing to. And I hope they raise 10 times, 100 times as much money as they have because it's going to be spent right through one of the finest networks of creative cooperation imaginable. And I'll close with this. Best political book I've read in the last five years was written by a double Nobel Prize winning microbiologist who is well into his 80s now and still has the mind of a 20-year-old man. It's by E.O. Wilson, and it's called The Social Conquest of Earth. You can read it quickly. It's only about 250 pages long. And Wilson, whom I know a little and admire a lot, is the first guy who told me in his microbiology work that the combined weight of all the ants on Earth is greater than the combined weight of all the people on Earth. That's a lot of ants. <laughs> so I've been interested in him ever since he told me that little factoid. Don't you like, don't you all, at least the non-scientists here, don't you like having a factoid like that you can sort of drop in the middle of any conversation and <laughs> get a laugh and say, wow, that guy's not as dumb as I thought. <laughs> anyway, what this book tries to do, as best the evidence allows it, is to trace the trajectory of all life on Earth, not just human life, all life on Earth, from single cell organisms emerging from the primordial slime down to the current day. And what Wilson has tried to do, because he's always been really upset when species start disappearing too fast, so he's really hacked off now because we're at about a 10,000 year high for species disappearance because of climate change. But he said that if you look at all the species that have ever evolved and existed on planet Earth, and you make some allowance for the fact that the dinosaurs are whacked by an asteroid hitting the Earth and messing up the planet for a good long time, you have to conclude that the most important species that ever lived in terms of durability are ants, termites, bees, and people. Because they had lots of chances to be destroyed, and they haven't been. And he talks about ants that are being chased by predators, and some of the ants will go up on the highest blade of grass and sacrifice themselves so that everybody else gets away, apparently without a mind or any consciousness by evolution. Termites in hot climates that live only in hot and air-conditioned housing. They drill holes under the ground, and then they drill five holes, and they'll only go in and out of one, ever. And when it's about to rain, they won't go in any of them, because they know. Only by evolution. And we all know a lot about all the things bees do for us, pollinating directly or indirectly more than 95% of what we consume. He says, people are the most interesting case of all, because unlike ants, termites, and bees, we have both consciousness and a conscience. And it gives us virtually unlimited possibilities to accomplish great things together if we cooperate. He said it also puts us at great peril because we're always stepping right up to the edge of our own destruction by thinking we're smarter than we are and being subject to arrogance and twisting our conscience around to believe that we have to be superior to somebody else and look at them 
in effect, by a negative reference. And then in the end, he says, you know, on balance, I think we're all going to make it. And this is all going to work out. And progress will continue. And we're about to enter a whole new golden era. I think that because we have passed up every single chance we had to destroy ourselves. Interesting thing for a man who's now 87 to say. I say that because there's a very human reason that you should all be doing this. There's a reason we can all identify with Tina's story, with Tina's family, with Tina's wish. If you're not a scientist, the most important finding of the human genome is that every non-age-related difference you can see in this room is rooted in one half of 1% of your genome. Otherwise, we're 99.5% the same, even across gender lines. Now, since you have 3.6 billion genomes, that's still a fair, not insignificant number, half a percent of what that. But you get the idea. The biggest problem we've got in life is that nearly all of us, and I'm not just talking about political disagreements on everything, nearly all of us spend 99.5% of our time thinking about the half a percent of us that's different, don't we? I remember the first time I read this stunning discovery that unless all of your ancestors are from sub-Saharan Africa, between 1 and 4 percent of your genome comes from our pre-human ancestors, the Neanderthals, because they weren't extinct until about 40,000 years ago, and we moved out of Africa into Europe and the Middle East 90 to 100,000 years ago. So we spent at least 40,000 years running around together. It turns out we liked each other better than anybody knew. So I thought I had found something really good. And I, I literally, I called Hillary and Chelsea, got them both on the phone. And I said, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> and they both said the same thing, <laughs> almost raised. We always knew you were part Neanderthal. <laughs> they were, however, exceedingly surprised to discover they were, too. <laughs> Now, we're laughing, but I want you to take this seriously. Ordinary citizens without a scientific background, with a human concern that can identify with other people, are being given a chance to solve a problem that should have been easier to solve than it's turned out to be. Once solved, we know it will immediately become much more affordable than we would otherwise think because of what detection costs and everything else. And we're being asked to solve this problem at the time that the scientific freight train is going down the tracks at the most rapid rate in our lifetime. To play a small role in a giant effort led by very big brains working together to guarantee 100 percent survival and redeem Tina's wish and redeem the best parts of the unfulfilled lives of every person we ever lost. It's worth doing. Thanks for being here and stay with it.